Okay, so I'm going to give my greeting again. This is the uh, September 21st, 2021 meeting of the Transportation Parking Commission. My name is Donna Lascali. I'm the Director of Public Works. I'm Chair of the Commission. Um, and uh, I'd like to welcome everyone. There's uh, quite a crowd that has gathered. Um, so uh, what I would like to do is, uh, Beth, if you are ready, let's call the roll, please. Donna? Here. Jody? Here. Jamie? Here. Wayne? Here. Nancy? Here. Karen? She's restarting, right? Um, no, she's here. Hold on just a moment. I'm going to hey. unmute her. All set. Here. Jim? Here. Adam? Here. And Diana. Is Diana not here? She's here. Yeah, she's here. It looks like um, we're having some technical difficulties oh, there she is. hearing her. Um, we see her, but we do not have audio on you, Diana. Okay, Beth, I think you can mark Diana as here. We're going to have to work through some uh, audio difficulties. You may have to disconnect and come back in possibly. Great. Is it is it working? Oh, there now? we go. Yeah, oh, we got you now. Great. Thank you. Sorry about that. Yeah, thanks very much. Okay. So that's, everybody is here and accounted for, every single person who is a voting member. Thank you, Beth. Okay, uh, next on the agenda is uh, public comment. Um, this is where uh, anyone can speak to the commission on any topic. We ask that you limit your comments to three minutes, please. State your name and uh, uh, city or town of, of residence for the record. If you are here to speak about a particular item on the agenda, um, it is generally more efficient um, for me to move through the agenda and I will uh, designate time uh, for public comment uh, on that particular agenda item. And that's how we uh, try to keep these meetings organized. So um, again, if you are here to speak on a particular agenda item, um, you can, if you wouldn't mind holding until that agenda item uh, comes up. Um, in the meantime, uh, if, if there is someone here to speak on a topic that is not on the agenda um, and wants to speak to the commission, uh, you are welcome to do so now. Um, please raise your uh, virtual hand um, or um, your actual hand and we will try to see you. Um, first is uh, uh, Lily Lombard. I will unmute you in a moment. Great, am I here? Yep, go ahead, Lily. Okay, hi everybody. Lily Lombard, I live in Northampton. Um, I, there are a couple of comments I did want to make related to things on the agenda, but I won't be able to say for the whole meeting, knowing that there is a picture Main Street um, forum kind of cutting partway through this meeting. So um, um, allow me to just mention a few things. I'm part of a group called Main Street for Everyone. I know you remember at the last meeting you had <clears throat> one of our fellow members, Ben Weil, made a presentation um, that was on the agenda about some of our um, design recommendations, including instituting right away um, some dynamic pricing or demand parking um, so that we can ease the, um, the Im immediately ease the uh, demand for parking on Main Street by using pricing to do that. And so I, um, I do recommend that as a committee, you, I know that there is at least one member of your committee that is um, <clears throat> taken a particular interest in that, has written a right, uh, white paper on it, Adam Novit. Um, I think it would be worthwhile for this commission to um, open that back up. I think there's a lot of appetite in the community for addressing ongoing parking issues downtown that have been distilled to unfortunately the type of parking that we have instead of the management of the parking and the num and, and the the number of parking spots being sort of the scapegoat. So um, I, I encourage that. I also encourage you to, as a commission, take on the the um, 
the recommendations of uh, Main Street related to parking, since it's very much in your wheelhouse and really look at what the design um, recommendations from the city are and um, uh, provide some advice and recommendations on those. So those are two, two things that I wanted to mention. The other thing is that related to some things on your agenda, being a resident in the South Street neighborhood, I'm in favor of traffic calming measures on all of street. So I, um, I'm sorry I can't participate in that and, and, or react to your conversation, but I hope that you will, um, you will take it seriously because I know it is an ongoing problem in the neighborhood. And then the last thing is I know that there is a proposed ordinance uh, relative to parking on Main Street, I believe related to um, dangerous angle parking spots that back into crosswalks and removing those spots right away just makes a whole lot of sense to me. So those are my comments. Thanks very much. Thanks, Lily. Next is Amy. Amy, we're gonna ask you to unmute here. There we go. Uh, yeah, I was trying to. It had told me I couldn't unmute myself. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we got you. Thank Great. you. Great. Hi, I'm Amy Meltzer. I live in Northampton. Uh, I'm gonna speak later about an item on the agenda. I just wanted to reflect back to uh, members of the commission uh, how confusing the process of, of trying to have a voice in this is for just sort of like an ordinary citizen like myself. Um, a couple of years ago, <coughs> Um, I tried very actively to get some conversation and, and action about the lane where people consistently drive in the bike lane on South Street right before Maine. Had a lot of conversations with Jim Nash, who said, oh, yes, DPW sees it's a problem. I have no idea. No one ever let me know. Did anything happen? Is nothing going to happen? Similarly, when it came to Olive Street, um, you know, I did fill out the traffic calming request. There was no automated anything to let me know it had come. And I didn't hear a peep until June, literally the day before it was supposed to be on the agenda to say, oh, it's gonna be on the agenda tomorrow. I totally recognize this has been a crazy time. People are really busy, but um, I still don't understand anything about how this works. And um, I understand from the mission that this is a committee that really wants to be clear and transparent. So I just wanted to reflect back that it's it, it's quite difficult as an outsider, and I think there might be ways to improve uh, like transparency and communication so we understand how the process works. That's all. Okay, thank you. Next is Ian. Hi, this is Susan Murphy. I'm showing up as Ian. <laughs> I'm a resident of Northampton, also in the South Street neighborhood. Um, and I am also not able to stay for the full meeting, um, but just want, um, I'm interested in the, the traffic calming request on Olive Street. Um, I am very familiar with and observe on a daily basis um, the, the real traffic problems that we have um, both on Olive and Fort Street with people speeding down into and out of the meadows. Um, I see that Chief Casper is also on the line. I want to um, thank her for um, her responsiveness in, um, I sent earlier this year, a letter to her expressing concern about activity in the meadows um, down on Old Springfield Road um, and, and trash and speeding and drinking and drugs down there. And um, she was very responsive, so I wanted to thank her for that but um, anything that we can do to reduce the dangerous speeding and and I'm guessing impaired driving that happens in that area I would appreciate your efforts okay thank you for your comments um, is there anyone else who has a uh, comment for the commission Michael Sullivan like... said he has a comment okay Go ahead, Michael, we'll unmute you in a moment here. Hi, uh, can you hear me? We can, yes, oh, go ahead. Oh, thank you. 
Um, yeah, I, I, I um, Michael Sullivan, 25 Fort Street, Northampton. I'll, I'll wait till the the um, uh, traffic calming on Olive comes up for one of my comments. But the other thing I uh, wanted to mention was about traffic calming on South Street. Um, so um, a few, couple of months ago, I guess in was it May maybe um, there was um, a uh, one of these electronic um, uh, things that measure speeds of cars. Um, and <clears throat> I know that the year before that, there had been one placed. And the conclusion was that there wasn't speeding on South Street. Um, the thing I want, wanted to point out was that both times it was placed on Columbus Street, um, just south of where the speed limit changes. So it was showing that cars were just about, just a little bit above the speed limit but 50, you know, of about 35, mile, of 35 miles per hour, but 50 feet later, the speed limit drops to 25 and then it drops to 20. So um, I, I think that was, uh, seems to me an ineffective way of capturing speeding cars. You should have it, uh, you know, obviously car, cars could be going at 45 miles an hour, see the 25 mile an hour speed limit ahead, slow down to 35 and then be measured at 35. And, and, and that would be recorded as not speeding, even though they're going faster when it drops down to 25. Um, and that's also just from personal experience. I mean, when I drive out of Fort Street and I make a right, Fort is just below Columbus. It goes Fort, Columbus, drops to 25 at Edwidge Terrace, and then Monroe, it's 20, I believe it's 20 by sometime between Monroe and Lyman. <clears throat> Excuse me. So usually when I make a right turn out of Fort Street, I have to basically start from zero and uh, I'll, I'll be going at 25, 30, 35 over the speed limit, cars will come up right behind me. So they're clearly going faster. So this is just um, a petition to a, a, a plea to uh, re uh, measure the speeds at South Street, but do it in the way that, for example, either you put the, you put the measurement right in the middle of the 35 mile an hour speed limit to see if they're going over 35 or, and, and maybe both actually, you also put it in the middle right at the 25 mile an hour speed limit to see if they're speeding. I think that would be a more effective way to capture all these speeding cars. Thank you. Okay, thanks for your comments. Brett is next. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Brett Constantine. I sit on the uh, pedestrian and bicycle subcommittee underneath this committee, and I just wanted to say hi that I'm here and uh, we'll report back to the subcommittee be a liaison between the two committees. Thanks. Thanks very much, Brett. Appreciate it. Does anyone else have any comments for the for the commission? Okay, seeing and hearing none, uh, we will move to approval of the minutes from the previous meeting, which was July 20th, 2021. May I have a motion for approval, please? So move. move approval. Second. Okay, is there any discussion on the, on the minutes from the previous meeting? Okay, hearing, hearing none. Beth, please call the roll. Mm -hmm. Yes. Jody. Abstain. Jamie. Yes. Wayne. Yes. Siri. Nancy. Yes. Karen. Yes. Jim. Yes. Adam. Uh, yes. Diana. Yes. Hey, do you have any idea once you're already in a meeting how to disable the chat? Okay. Thank you, Beth. Okay, next is reports from departments and subcommittees. Um, I'll run through a few updates from DPW. Um, the Sonic Street parking lot project has been completed. Um, that was to address a uh, failing sewer line uh, that has been remedied. There's temporary paving that has uh, been installed in the construction area that actually needs to um, settle and we'll be doing a permanent patch there. 
um, later in the year. Um, Roundhouse parking lot uh, continues to be under construction. That project's being managed by Central Services. Um, we're also paving several streets as part of our paving contract for 2021. Uh, Warner Brothers is working to improve Pine Street, Warfield Place, Hayes Avenue, Meadow Street, and Loudville Road. We have several detours that have been implemented to uh, facilitate this work. Uh, Meadow Street Bridge is currently closed to all traffic and there's a detour in place. Um, pavement reclamation began uh, actually this past Monday and is going to continue into uh, next week. Um, then we're going to get a base course down that'll begin on Friday, September 24th and continue into next week and final paving will occur um, towards the end of October and early November. Um, I would encourage uh, anyone in these areas to seek alternate routes as, as there will definitely be delays. Um, there are also several mass DOT projects going on. Um, there's the King Street Corridor, there's the Damon Road reconstruction, um, the Exit 19 Roundabout, and the I-91 Bridges over Route 5, the Railroad, and Hockenham Road. These are all projects that are managed by mass DOT. Um, there is some level of coordination with the city, um, but these projects are managed by MassDOT. We field a lot of uh, questions and complaints um, and uh, about this and do what we can to answer people's concerns, but generally um, we refer folks to, um, uh, to the district, um, to the MassDOT district um, for resolution on whatever their concerns are with these projects. Um, Wayne, do you have anything for us? I do, just a few quick updates. So we just awarded the contract for for Pleasant Street, which is a complete streets project to add bicycle combinations between Hockman Road and the roundabout and improve the sidewalks uh, and then repave it. Um, we've awarded a contract for Leonard Street and Leeds, which is to make the intersection with Route 9 a right angle to slow the speed of traffic. Coming onto Leonard Street, we've awarded but haven't yet signed a contract for Florence Center, which is to um, improve wheelchair uh, curb ramps where they don't meet ADA standards, replace the absolute worst sidewalk sections and add some street trees. Um, the picture Main Street projects moving forward, we have three forms, one tonight and then two more in the next few weeks. Tonight's the most technical from King Street East. Um, and so, you know, obviously take part in that. And then Thursday, we have a public forum on our rapid recovery plan. Um, and the part of that that overlaps the transportation is opening up, reopening or re-examining the recommendations from Walker Parking a few years ago about um, potentially changing the hours of parking rates and the collection rates to get vacancy up. That's what my list. Okay, thanks, Wayne. Anyone else have any uh, updates? Any other departments or subcommittees um, wish to speak? Okay, seeing and hearing none, uh, we'll next move to matters before the commission. 5A is a proposed ordinance for a stop sign at the intersection of Cross Path Road and Riverbank Road. I'll read the ordinance in the year 2021 upon the recommendation of the Transportation and Parking Commission. It's an ordinance relative to a stop sign on Cross Path Road. An ordinance of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, be it ordained by the City Council of the City of Northampton, in City Council assembled as follows. Section 1, Section 312-113 of the Code of Ordinances be amended as follows. Section 312-113, Schedule 12, Stop and Yield Intersections, Location, Cross Path Road, Direction of Travel North at the intersection of Riverbank Road. May I have a motion for a positive recommendation, please? I'll make that motion. I'll second. Okay, so the background on this is that um, uh, several trees and, and uh, quite a bit of vegetation was cleared along parcels uh, of Riverbank Road adjacent to the Connecticut River um, in August of, of this year. Uh, a slope to the Connecticut River begins approximately 10 feet from the edge of the roadway. Um, it has a, about a 20 or 30 foot drop into the river. Um, since the removal of the trees and the vegetation, uh, the whole area has really been uh, opened up in a way where there are no natural barriers to errant vehicles that could potentially leave the paved roadway and, and uh, enter the river. 
um, a, as a safety improvement um, after uh, engineering re reviewed the intersection, reviewed the roadway, um, and reviewed uh, potential hazards to the motoring public, um, we recommend the installation of a stop ahead sign, uh, two stop signs, and two directional large arrow signs as shown in, in the map um, that, the, uh, that you can see on your screen here. Um, what this proposed ordinance does is establishes a stop approach on cross path road um, which again uh, is an uncontrolled intersection at this time. So motorists uh, who are traveling down Cross Path Road, um, particularly if it's dark or they're unfamiliar with the area, don't necessarily understand that they are uh, approaching an intersection where if they go straight there, there is a 20 to 30 foot drop um, into the river. So that is the background on, on this proposed ordinance. Any discussion? Council and Ash. Thank you, Director. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, in terms of the, I need to, this is in Ward 3 and I need to do some outreach on this, but I would expect that uh, residents down in this area who uh, uh, recently were expressing concerns about uh, the way traffic was moving would welcome this and I'm hoping that'll be the case. Um, and, um, but I, I, I'm interested in seeing this go forward uh, with the positive recommendation to council and, um, and I will work with constituents down there so that they understand um, what's being proposed here. So thank you for bringing this forward. Thank you, Councillor. Any other discussion? Councillor Foster. Thank you. This uh, this makes a lot of sense to me uh, from that description, and I'm I'm wondering. This isn't directly related to the ordinance, but if if down the road there could be the potential for a small section of, of guardrail or another physical safety improvement um, in in case people don't see the signage or, or don't notice it. That was part of our engineering assessment, um, and and there are um, particular warrants for guardrail because that was one of the things that we had considered in this area. Um, we actually have concrete blocks um, there now as an actual barrier um, in the event, you know, because it's it's an uncontrolled intersection. Um, but guardrail is not, uh, or, or guardrail is typically placed um, along the side of a road and not meant to prevent a uh, head-on collision. Um, it's meant to actually um, keep cars sort of within a traveled roadway when they are traveling uh, parallel to it. Um, so the danger here is more about a, a, um, a, a perpendicular action, which would send a car over the embankment. Um, um, and it's our assessment that we feel like um, signage, the, the roadway striping, um, as you see in the, in the plan um, uh, on the screen here, and uh, larger size directional arrows will um, completely communicate to drivers what they're supposed to do. Um, so, so to answer your question, guardrail is not warranted here. Counselor, Nash. Yes. Uh, so based on what you are saying, are, is the expectation that the concrete blocks will remain? They will remain in place until council acts um, on this ordinance um, and, and hopefully council gives approval um, to this signage. Um, and once we're able to sign the intersection uh, as part of that process, we will remove the barricades. Thank you. Any other comments? Any members of the commission on this? I'll just say that this seems like common sense. Okay. Thanks, Adam. We felt it was a good, uh, we felt it was, it would be good to implement this. So thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Seeing and hearing none, Beth, please call the roll. Uh, excuse me, Donna? Yes. Jody? Yes. Jamie? Yes. Wayne? 
Yes. Nancy? Yes. Karen? Yes. Jim? Yes. Adam? Yes. Diana? Yes. That passes. Thank you, Beth. Nine votes. Okay, next is 5B, proposed ordinance for a stop sign on Evergreen Road and Chestnut Avenue extension. I'll read the ordinance. In the year 2021, upon the recommendation of the Transportation and Parking Commission, an ordinance relative to stop signs on Evergreen Road and Chestnut Avenue, an ordinance of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, be it ordained by the City Council of the City of Northampton and City Council assembled as follows, section one. Section 312-113 of the Code of Ordinances be amended as follows. Section 312-113, Schedule 12, Stop and Yield Intersections. D, multi-way stop signs. Multi-way stop intersections are established at the following locations. Location, Evergreen Road, direction of travel, east slash west at the intersection of Chestnut Avenue and Chestnut Avenue Extension. Location, Chestnut Avenue, direction of travel north at the intersection of Evergreen Road and Chestnut Avenue Extension. May I have a motion for a positive recommendation, please? Motion. Second. Okay. Um, so after the development of Chest after the development of Chestnut Avenue Extension and Beaver Brook uh, Loop, um, both of which are privately owned, there have been concerns about traffic and near miss crashes. Um, that there have been uh, multiple requests from the neighborhood um, for a stop sign to be installed, um, and uh, you know we we have to make sure anytime we're installing uh, traffic controls that that we are hitting warrants, meaning that we are analyzing data and we have an engineering rationale for implementing whatever the decision may be. Um, we actually engaged an outside engineering firm to conduct a study of the intersection. Um, and uh, this engineering firm uh, took turning movement counts um, for peak hours. Um, and interestingly, there are not a lot of vehicles um, at this intersection. Um, in fact, there are so few vehicles uh, between 10 and 20 that that in and of itself does not warrant the use of stop signs here. Um, there were no crashes reported at the intersection from 2015 to 2019. However, um, there are obstructions such as trees, vegetation, and roadway geometry changes that absolutely affect visibility. Our, our engineering consultant, um, engineering firm named Fusson O'Neill, recommended um, that this intersection become a four-way stop controlled intersection based on the steep roadway grade changes. Any comments from any members of the commission? And then I know there are likely some members of the public here to speak on this, so we'll open it up to them. But first, any comments from any members of the commission? Hi, yeah, I have uh, one question about the ordinance. It says direction of travel north, but the diagram that we have shows uh, both north and south direction of travel. Is that is that an error in the ordinance, perhaps? Um, the person who's speaking, just identify themselves, please. It's Hi, Diana. This is Diana Day. Oh, sorry, I couldn't see. Um, this may be a Scribner's error. Let me, um, Maggie, should this say north, south? The north is for Chestnut Avenue, which is shown on the map as the southern approach. Chestnut Avenue extension is the northern section, and that is the privately owned area. So we don't actually have the authority to put an ordinance on the privately owned street. So it, the approach is for Chestnut Avenue going north towards Evergreen. Okay, so the so the only thing that can be written in the ordinance is the city controlled roadway. We do not control Chestnut Avenue extension. Extension, correct. Okay, thank you for the clarification. So not a uh, not a Scribner's error. Thank you. But a good question. Okay, any other comments from uh, members of the commission um, before we open this up to? Um, those who may be here from the public to comment. Okay, seeing none, Dale is first, Dale West.
There we go. Um, hi, I live in Leeds and I have uh, four kids who use that intersection daily, several times a day. Um, and I know in our neighborhood, there are about 25 or more kids that use the intersection um, to go to school. Um, so to and from school every day. Um, so it is, um, I know whatever the traffic study said, I'm not, you know, I think that there's a lot of uh, foot traffic that goes across that road. And um, some of them are really young children, some with like impulse um, uh, kind of control um, issues. And so I think that I'm, I'm highly in favor of the stop sign and, and we'll talk with our homeowners association about um, putting the stop sign from our end if the city can't do that um, for the Chestnut Avenue extension part. But, um, you know, I'm just in favor. I just think that we've had a, a few close calls and with kids on that road and it's just a, it's just an accident waiting to happen. So I think none of us want a disaster to happen. And um, so I'd love to have a four-way stop sign there. Okay, thank you for your comments. Thanks. Okay, next is Lauren. Good afternoon and thank you for your time. I'm Lauren Duffy and I live on Beaverbrook Loop in Leeds. I am speaking in favor of this proposal. What's not noted on the map is that there is an existing stop sign when leaving Chestnut Avenue extension. That's the road at the upper portion of your map. This is the privately owned road by the Homeowners Association that I and, and Dale also belong to. Um, so at this four way intersection right now, we only have one stop sign. I, along with many of my neighbors, are advocating for opposing traffic to be required to stop as well. That's traffic coming up from the bottom of your map. Though not easy to make out in the provided picture, that approach along Chestnut Avenue from the bottom uh, is steeply uphill, making visibility of any cars, bikes, or pedestrians traveling along Evergreen Road very difficult, if not impossible, even in daylight. For folks unfamiliar with the neighborhood, such as delivery drivers or really anyone driving at night, one can easily breeze right through without realizing the threat of cross traffic from Evergreen Road. This intersection is the only point of entry and egress for anyone living on Chestnut Avenue Extension and Beaverbrook Loop. My family lived here or moved here about six and a half years ago before many of our neighbors' homes were built, and we have witnessed the steady increase in traffic. Now approaching full capacity, there are approximately 29 residences on these two streets with about 30 children under the age of 13. The majority of these children pass through this intersection twice a day, every day, every school day, either on foot or by bike to attend Leeds Elementary. I have yet to hear us or speak to a neighbor who hasn't witnessed a near miss at this intersection or altered their driving, driving habits to accommodate the danger here. Based on our experiences, many of us approach with trepidation or stop even where there is no stop sign, which can cause confusion for other drivers. Personally, I was motivated to finally speak up on this issue a couple months ago when returning home with my two kids in the back seat of my car. We were on Evergreen Road coming from the right of your map, turning right onto Ch Chestnut Avenue extension into our neighborhood, and a car coming up the Chestnut Avenue hill proceeded to cross the intersection without looking, very nearly missing a collision with my rear driver's side door where my five-year-old was sitting. It's never been safe in my opinion that this intersection didn't have at least two if not the full four stop signs that are proposed this evening. Nearly four years ago, the president of our homeowners association reached out to the city and asked for a remedy. We were told at the time that a traffic study would be done and that we needed to wait our turn. But as far as I know, we have not heard anything more before now. For the safety of my family and my neighbors, I respectfully ask that you not put this off any longer. Okay, thank you. Next is Norma. Hi, I'm Norma Adler. Uh, I also live on Chestnut Avenue Extension. I counted up and there are actually 38 children under the age of 18 who live here. Not all of them are school eligible yet, but they will be at some point. Um, people, what, what hasn't been addressed is that people speed along Evergreen and they just barrel through from Chestnut Avenue into Chestnut Avenue Extension. If they're someone who doesn't live here, it's just a random driver or delivery person. 
speed is terrible and the sight lines, as you mentioned earlier, are very bad visibility with vegetation. I urge you to follow the recommendation and put in those three stop signs. It will help our neighborhood and everybody because you don't need near accidents and you certainly don't need an accident. Put up the stop signs before there is one. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Mayori. Hold on, we're, we're gonna unmute you here. Hold on just a moment. Unmute, there we go. Can you hear me? Yes. We can, welcome, okay. thank you. Yeah, just briefly, I wanted to say, you know, I've, I've heard from my residents and Lauren's uh, story from a couple months ago, you know, really drove home, you know, I know that scary feeling um, with kids around. So I just, just as ward counselor, counselor, I will be supporting this when it comes to full council. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you, counselor. I also want to note uh, for the record that we received an email from uh, Tanya Dragon, who is a resident of Nine Beaver Brook Loop. Um, and she is uh, also in support of the stop sign. Um, the email will be available as part of um, the minutes in the official record um, of this meeting, though I won't um, read it um, as part of the meeting. So I just wanted to make note of that. Um, Okay, any other comments uh, from uh, members of the public who, who may be um, here to speak on this topic? I don't see any. Um, any members of the commission have any comments or questions about this? Okay, seeing and hearing none, Beth, please call the roll. Excuse me, Donna. Yes. Jody. Yes. Jamie. Did Jamie leave? Jamie had a step out at four thirty, so he's not here. Uh, Wayne. Yes. Nancy. Yes. Karen. Yes. Jim. Yes. Adam. Yes. Diana. Yes. Unanimous. Okay, Passes. thank you, Beth. Okay, next is 5C, a proposed ordinance relative to parking on Main Street downtown. Um, this ordinance is quite long um, and I do need to read it. So I apologize in advance and I will move as quickly as possible. Um, in the year 2021, upon the recommendation of the Transportation and Parking Commission, an ordinance relative to parking on Main Street, an ordinance of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, be it ordained by the City Council of the City of Northampton and City Council assembled as follows. Section 1, Section 312-102 of the Court of Ordinances, Code of Ordinances be amended as follows. Section 312-102, Schedule 1, parking prohibited at all times, location, Main Street, side, northwest, from point 190 feet northeast of Cracker Barrel Alley to a point 238 feet northeast of Cracker Barrel Alley. Main Street added 12-7-2017 by ordinance number 17.376, side northwesterly from Center Street to a point 58 feet southwesterly from Center Street, location Main Street side southeast from a point 188 feet northeast of Old South Street to point 235 feet northeast of Old South Street, section two, that section 312-109 of the Code of Ordinances be amended as follows. Section 312-109, Schedule 8, on-street parking meter zones, location Main Street added 12-7-2017 by ordinance number 17.376, side northwest from 0.40 feet northeasterly from Cracker Barrel Alley to a point 172 feet northeasterly from Cracker Barrel Alley, time limit class two hours slash class 1A. Main Street, location, Main Street side northwest from a point 238 feet northeasterly from Cracker Barrel Alley to a point 58 feet southwesterly from Center Street, time limit slash class two hours slash class 1A. Location, Main Street added 1217-2017 by ordinance number 17.376 side southeast from a point 246 feet northeasterly from Old South Street to a point 428 feet northeasterly from Old South Street, time limit slash class, 
two hours slash class 1A, section three, that section 312-117 of the code of ordinances be amended as follows, section 312-117, schedule 16 on street and off street handicapped parking spaces, street, main street, side, northwesterly, location, the 14th space, northeast of Cracker Barrel Alley, van accessible. May I have a motion for a positive recommendation, please? Motion. Second. Okay. Um, Wayne, you want to speak to this? Sure. So as you all know, we're, the Picture Main Street project is looking at, you know, what should the future of Main Street be in five years and what's the full design? Um, as part of that process, one of the key steps was doing what's called a road safety audit, where we got together a lot of stakeholders from different backgrounds, DPW, planning, um, uh, transportation and parking, um, Mass dot, you know, our engineers, and identified some of the ch safety challenges. And one thing that came up was certainly the safety of the crosswalks. When we began holding public forums on picture in Northampton, um, lots of disagreement, lots of issues we're still working through in terms of parking and width, et cetera. But the one thing that we heard clearly from almost everybody, regardless of how they felt in the big picture, was that the city should think about some low hanging fruit and the specific low hanging fruit is cars that back up today onto crosswalks or cars that are so close to the crosswalk that they make pedestrians virtually invisible. And so that's the, the genesis of these five parking spots being dropped. Um, I don't want to put words in, in Nancy Forrester's mouth, but Nancy has been lobbying for this for a long time. So she gets credit for this um, in terms of the original concept. So as I said, this is really sort of the low hanging fruit. We didn't feel like we should wait five years for because we know these are crashes waiting to happen. And you can see from the photo before you, you can just sort of guess the cars that literally to back up, they have to hit the crosswalk. Um, and that's a really bad situation. Okay, thanks Wayne, I appreciate it. Yeah, I'll, I'll add that, um, you know, you, you never want cars to have to back into a crosswalk um, to get out of a parking spot. So um, that's what we're trying to avoid here. Um, any comments from any members of the commission on this? Nancy, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Nancy. Go ahead. I'm very much in support of this ordinance um, change because it removes a number of sightline obstructions and will uh, greatly enhance pedestrian safety and um, traffic safety in general. So thank you very much for moving forward on this. Okay, thank you. Okay, Councilor Nash, go ahead. Thank you, Director. Yeah, I just uh, kudos to Nancy for staying on top of this. We walked around downtown probably four years ago, maybe five years ago on a beautiful day like today. And, um, and you know, Nancy's been on this for a number of years. And yeah, and it's been, this has come up in the Disability Commission as well. This has been an ongoing issue and it's really great. We're finally figuring out how to, how to address this. So um, thank you for bringing this proposal forward. Thank you. Councilor Foster, go ahead. I, I would like to maybe fourth what the other said, that um, this, is a, this is a great opportunity to improve visibility and pedestrian safety. And I think that's great. Um, I saw it after it had been posted and wanted to make a request that we amend both the map and the ordinance to change from handicapped parking space to accessible parking space. If I could add, totally agree with what, what Councilor Foster said. We had a separate conversation offline saying, this is a great beginning for that. We should go through the entire code of ordinances because when I Googled after Councilor Foster sent me email, this handicapped parking shows up a lot of time, but I don't think we have time to do that now. So this would be sort of the down payment for that change. We should make that change wholesale. It um, Councillor, I'm sorry. Where specifically in the ordinance are you um, are you looking at under uh, Schedule Eight? Is that what? You, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Section Three, Schedule Sixteen. Yes. Is that what you're looking at? Under Section Three, and then as well as on the map for the new van accessible space. Um, so it's both on the map um, 
on the lower half of the map, and then section three on the written ordinance. So where it says, I'm sorry, I just want to understand what you're asking. So section 312-117 schedule 16 on street and off street handicapped parking spaces, you'd like that to say accessible parking spaces. Yes, and that's a newer change that um, we talked with Nancy about and it went through Disability Commission and um, the Ordinance Review Commission, but it's been kind of an under the radar uh, change moving forward. And so as Wayne mentioned, the the handicapped parking space is going to show up, you know, in in a million ordinances throughout the city. Um, but moving forward, the preferred language uh, would be to say an accessible parking space rather than a handicapped parking space. Okay, we can we will absolutely um, prior to sending this forward to um, the clerk of the council, we will amend our map procedurally. I just want to be clear. Um, that we can actually rename schedule 16 within this? Can we actually rename schedule 16 within this discussion? Or is that require a separate ordinance change? That is a great question. Um, Wayne, Wayne, do you know? Because my understanding is, is changing the terminology which we did in this sort of global um, ordinance for accessible parking permits. I don't know specifically about this. If we can't, then it's something that I'm happy to work on behind the scenes and bring forward. And um, um, But I, I'm not actually positive. I, I don't know the answer. I did go, go through the um, state law, the state statutes, and just did a wholesale search for handicap parking and obviously it doesn't show up there. So it's not that the state constrains us. You know, some things we have to use the state's terms. So I think it's a local decision, but as to Donna's point about, do we need to do all the ordinances first or can we do this separately? I frankly I didn't look at that level of detail. So I'm not sure the answer. But if, if we could, if, if you who people made the motion are comfortable, we can do that research before it gets introduced. And if we can't amend it, we do it now. And otherwise we'll just do the bigger piece so we don't have to come back before this committee. Or I think the, the other option is uh, we send it and it can be amended in legislative matters if, if it can actually be amended um, or unless there actually needs to be a, a specific um, something written for this particular schedule um, to rename it. Um, but, but that might be a better strategy is to, is to send it like this um, and, and have it amended in legislative matters. That makes sense and we can do the research between now and then. Okay. Okay, but what we will do is we, we will revise our map in the meantime um, in, in preparation for that. Um, Keith, I see your hand up. Uh, we'll unmute you. Go ahead, Keith. Uh, yeah, uh, just just uh, to reiterate that the state's language is, is still a disability placard. Uh, it's not an accessible placard. So there's still going to be some differences in the language between the city and the state, especially when it comes to the placards. So just uh, forward. That's all. Okay, thank you. All right, any other comments on this from uh, members of the public or members of the commission? So to be clear, we'll be sending this as written, um, but look for a potential revision in legislative matters um, once, once we're able to determine if we can actually do that. Okay, uh, Councillor Nash, go ahead. I didn't want to lengthen the meeting at all, but I, wanted, I just want to say this, what uh, Councillor Foster is proposing here, this change in language is really, it's, it's the right way to go. And, and I think it's wise to send it to legislative matters. Uh, the city solicitor is part of that meeting and, you know, and the, you know, legally what needs to be in place will, can get determined at that meeting. Ultimately, you know, the big deal is moving forward, we want this change to happen. And that also at the same time, 
we're, we're working around the language, the broader language change around accessibility uh, from handicap. And, um, and so hopefully we can solve these two together at legislative matters. And if not, we'll, we'll figure out on a, on a broader scale how to address it. So anyway, send it okay. forward. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Any other comments? Okay, seeing and hearing none, Beth, please call the roll. Anna? Yes. Jody? Yes. Jamie's still gone? Jamie is uh, gone. Wayne? Yes. Nancy? Yes. Karen? Yes. Jim? Yes. Adam? Yes. Diana? Yes. Eight eyes passes. Thank you, Beth. Next is 5D, a discussion of a traffic calming request on Olive Street. Um, so I'll just give a little uh, background on this. Um, so uh, this traffic calming request was submitted February 24th, 2021. The resident concern was cars going in and out of the meadows from Olive Street at extremely high speeds, particularly after dark. Um, and uh, the, the, um, the person who filled the form out also noted there's no sidewalk on that stretch of the street. People in the neighborhood uh, use the connection to Fort Street when taking pets for evening walks. It seems like it's gotten worse recently. I'm concerned someone is going to get hit. It's impossible to install even a temporary speed bump of some sort on the hill. Um, so I, this is, uh, again, we have a, uh, a traffic coming process that we move through when we get requests like this. And uh, what we do is, is uh, an engineering assessment of the area to determine roadway characteristics. Um, and then uh, the police chief collects uh, speed and volume data. So I will speak to um, just the, the physical characteristics of the roadway. Um, the chief will speak to um, the, the data that she collected, um, and then I will open it up to members of the public uh, who may uh, wish to tell us about their experience here. Um, so uh, this street connects South Street and Old Springfield Road. It is 1,260 feet long and 24 feet wide. There are existing sidewalks on both sides, starting at South Street and ending approximately 250 feet west of Old Springfield Road. Um, sidewalks are asphalt uh, with uh, a smattering of a few concrete sections. There is one marked crosswalk at the intersection with South Street. Parking is prohibited on the southeast side for the entire length of the street. There is no record of a speed regulation for this street in the absence of a speed regulation. Um, that means that there is a de facto speed limit in place of 30 miles an hour uh, and the pavement is in fair condition. Um, Chief, would you like to speak to the data that, that you collected here? Sure, thank you. Uh, we did a five-year look back on collision data. That was February 26 of 2021. And in the five-year look back, we identified zero collisions on Olive Street uh, in that five-year period. We also looked at speed data. We had looked at speed data in October of 2020. Um, so we used that same data. Uh, had the speed collection device had been in place for a week or five days. Uh, and during the assessment period, 480 vehicles were analyzed. And there were only 11 cars out of those 480 that were identified as enforceable violations. The 85th percentile was 22.3 miles per hour. So it's not really an identified speeding problem on the street. It was a little bit unique that the very few vehicles that we had that were uh, operating uh, at excessive speeds were in the evening hours. Most, most of our speeding problems are um, during commuter hours. So it was certainly notable that it's likely that what some of the local residents mentioned is that people are coming out of the meadows and that seems to be consistent with the, the handful of cars that we found. Uh, but overall, not uh, a significant speeding issue on Olive Street. Yeah, exactly. Okay, thank you, Chief. Um, now I will open it up to any members of the public who uh, may wish to speak about this um, and uh, sort of tell us what your experience is. Councillor Thorpe, I see your hand up. Welcome, we'll unmute you in a moment. 
Thank you, and, and thank you for having this on the agenda. And and uh, I've heard many concerns from the constituents on Olive Street regarding the speeding and the, um, you know, the concerns that someone could eventually get hurt someday with the rate of traffic and um, the speeding. And I, I appreciate Chief Casper with her uh, data collection. I just need to uh, get clarification. The data that was collected was that from 2000. 20, I just heard. Yep, the speed data was collected October 19th through October 23rd of 2020. Okay, so there's nothing recent. Um, is there any way that we can, you know, have something um, put in place moving forward to see where it's at now? Is there a possibility to do that? So this is considered still good data. There haven't been any significant changes to the street since that time. So as you can imagine, we get a lot of requests for, you know, that people want data taken again when they feel like they have a problem, but um, the data doesn't change that much, even if we put it back up. I mean, here we are, it's been a year later, so we'll probably see similar traffic patterns. Um, if something substantially had changed or we had had sudden increases in collisions or something like that, it might warrant putting it up again. But October 2020 is still considered pretty good data. I would add that just due to the, the neighborhood complaints, our traffic officers actually went out there, they put up the speed display sign to, to caution drivers just to you know, have something up there to show what speeds of vehicles are. And they were out there just in late December and in early January of this year. I know that's not the time the meadows are, are, are open and busy, but they were out there. They didn't observe any violations. Um, so we have been, you know, we had some engagement with it uh, earlier this year. Okay. Thank you, Chief Casper. And I'm hoping that um, maybe it can be considered um, down the road sooner rather than later. I'm sure you're gonna hear from some other residents um, from the area regarding possibility of having um, a speed bump or, or additional signage around that area. And what's gonna end up happening, I'm just gonna to stick to what is on the agenda is Olive Street. I feel you're gonna hear from other um, residents around the, um, the that area regarding speeding, not just on um, Olive Street, but uh, around other side streets on, around that area. So, so thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, next is Kerry. Hello. Hi, Kerry. Hi. Um, I wanna say thanks, first of all, for having this on the agenda. Um, I live on Olive Street at 26 Olive. I have a one-year-old son who's walking and playing on the street and I am definitely concerned about the traffic and the speed. Um, it's really the speed that people go down and I realize that January, December, they did the speed you know, analysis there and they didn't see anything, but the summer months are a whole different story of boats and trailers and the farm equipment trucks from the mixed use area. And I just really would appreciate, you know, the commission's consideration on anything that to help moderate that speed that's going on, or even the blind curve going down at the bottom of the hill. It's really tricky for anyone who wants to be a pedestrian with the way the cars come up and down the hill. Okay, thank you for your comments. Okay, next is Amy. Hi, um, I, uh, a couple things. Um, I live on 11 Olive Street uh, near the top of the hill. And um, one, I guess I'm just noting, in addition to the month when the data was taken, um, October, when there isn't like a lot of water skiing and, and warm weather events going down in the meadows, it's also Monday through Friday. And while I know there's been a notice of evenings, I would say weekends are also a really prime time for this traffic. And so, um, you know, as I said earlier, and sort of like I have a lack of understanding of how this process works, but I think, you know, we certainly as neighbors could have given feedback as to when might be the time to witness when this problem is the greatest. So, you know, I would say on Monday through Friday in October, 
is not the peak issue of the problem. I don't know the kinds of solutions that can go in, and so I don't know if they're temporary versus permanent solutions, but, but if that were a possibility, even thinking about like the weekends when there are events in the meadows or that is when it's the strongest. The other piece I wanted to share, and again, I just, I just don't know if this got shared when I sent it as a comment, but um, I'm just putting in the chat that I actually made a video of the, um, the very steep curve. So um, it was mentioned that there's, there's stops being a sidewalk a certain number of yards, I think it was 300 some yards before the actual meadows. That piece where there's no sidewalk, um, what you have is a lot of foot traffic because Olive Street, as I'm sure a lot of you know, our people uh, really enjoy walking to the meadows and walking their dogs down to the meadows. And they get to this place where there's suddenly the sidewalks disappear, there's a really steep curve. Um, and as cars come up that curve, and that's what I made a video of, I had my daughter sit in the passenger seat while I, well, she videoed while I drove up to see that if you're speeding up, um, you really can't see anyone who's at the top of that hill because of the grade of the curve um, until you basically are about to hit them. And if you're going slowly, that's not a problem, but if you're speeding, it's a big problem. So that area is of particular concern where there's no sidewalks and a really steep grade right as people are barreling out of the meadows. That's all. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I, I can just, um, I, I can clarify the process a little bit. It, you know, we, we receive um, a, a lot of comments from folks in, in many places all over the city, um, you know, uh, about speeding or, or some sort of roadway hazard. So um, what we always try to do is collect data in advance of speaking to them just so that uh, public works um, it, and the police department can bring that data to this commission so that then the commission members can hear, you know, what our data collection has returned. And then what we do is we open it up to, you know, the residents of the street to, to give us more information um, that we may not um, have been privy to, um, or, or that may help us to, um, you know, as we try to navigate what to do in a situation like this. So, so the purpose of this discussion today is to tell you, um, you know, what Public Works found and, and what the police department found, and then to listen um, from residents of, of the street, um, you know, from Councilor Thorpe, and hear if there are other things that that we need to consider in determining, um, you know, what what this problem might be, or or what you know what we need to do to um, to arrest it moving forward. Um, so that hopefully clarifies this process a, a little bit. Um, and I, I will uh, open it up to members of the commission if if you have any. Um, comments or questions about what the chief or I have have presented here, or, or any comments uh, about what we've heard from members of the public. Diana, go ahead. Um, I just had a question for the chief about: Did I hear that there were signs that were were put up in December and January, or, or can you explain that for me, please? Sure, not a not a permanent sign, but we have two types of speed collection devices. We have covert speed collection devices, which are very small little boxes that you might not notice if you drove by them. They use a radar system to collect data. And then we also have what you may more traditionally see, which are large signs that actually display your speed. Those collect data too, but we don't use them in the same way because obviously if people know they're there, they may drive more slowly. So we, they're a good way. They're really best used to help drivers understand what their normal driving behavior is on a street and hopefully slow them down. So that's the temporary sign slash, uh, you know, visual display box of speed that was out there. Thank you. Okay, next I see uh, Luke Brown has a hand up here. Yes, hello, uh, Luke here. I um, live on Olive Street at 50 Olive, so somewhat towards the middle, but a bit closer towards the meadows. And I think really what makes this sort of different from just the facts that were stated uh, really is that hill. And I just wanna spend a bit more time trying to articulate how this is unique. I think if any of us, were to go down to the bottom, the base of Olive, where it connects with um, Old Springfield Road, and were to imagine driving a car at 30 miles an hour, 
around what is a narrow road with all sorts of curves that make it sort of obstructed, um, you wouldn't feel safe if you knew no one was walking there. You wouldn't. Uh, it is impossible to drive a car at 30 miles an hour up that curve feeling safe. Um, and then add in the fact that as everyone has said, this is sort of a highway of people walking and dogs for folks coming off of south and into the uh, meadows. So uh, really respect and appreciate sort of the study that was done. But I think if the sort of basis from which we define acceptable is 30 miles an hour, and we don't all go down there and see how absolutely unacceptable I think any um, person would define that to be trying to drive a car, never mind the people walking, I think that's sort of the, the, the unique challenge here. Uh, we moved in in, in November and um, it's terrifying walking around that area, never mind at night because there's no lights and, and um, uh, sort of sidewalks. So that, that's what I think we just can't emphasize enough is, and I, and I, Amy, for the first time, just looked at that video. And I think if you just click that and you see the initial snapshot, you see a truck, right, is sort of in order to drive up it, kind of has to be in the middle of it. Um, and and it um, gives you some sense of it. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jamie. I see your hand up. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add, um, I, I certainly understand what Amy and others are saying uh, firsthand because I live on the corner of Manhan Street and Fort Street, uh, which is the other hill coming up from the meadows from the same spot. And, uh, it, you know, I don't know what it is and why there's an increase, but I, I do also notice an increase in traffic, especially uh, pickup trucks. Uh, they go way faster and are way larger than these narrow roads uh, should be handling at those speeds. Uh, it certainly makes me uncomfortable. It's a, it's a heavily trafficked pedestrian route. Uh, everyone in the neighborhood, especially since COVID started, uh, walks up and down that hill and through there, uh, kids and everything. So um, yeah, it's real for us that are in the neighborhood, certainly. Okay, thanks, Jamie, I appreciate it. Um, next is Carolyn. Hi, yes, thanks. Um, I live at 31 Olive Street and I've been here for 37 years. So I don't have the data data, but I can tell you with certainty, uh, just anecdotally that it's gotten worse and worse, especially in the last few years. Um, I echo everything people have said about the hill, but also just the street. Sometimes there's literal, uh, feels like drag racing at night a couple of times, especially on the weekend. Um, and now that we, we have more families with young children, I really fear for that. Um, it's too scary. It's, there's got to be a way to slow it down on this street. And I agree that, um, you know, having done the data collection in the late fall and then having police there in December and January isn't a full enough picture because as people have said, that's not the prime time when people are really using the meadows and fishing and going back and forth and the trucks and the boats, it's way heavier. But overall, it's pretty scary. And I, I just need to say that as someone who's been here for many years, and also as someone who never speaks at meetings, barely attends them, that's how strongly I feel about it. So thank you for um, considering this. I think it's a real dangerous problem. Okay, thanks for your comments. Okay, next is Lily. Hi, I live in this neighborhood too. And this conversation actually sparked two important memories that I wanted to relate. And I don't know if they got, either one of them got into the police record. I'd be curious. Both happened during the pandemic. One at the early part of it, and that is our neighbors who live right at the bottom of that intersection of all of Old Springfield and Fort Street had their hedgerow completely mowed down by a car that was coming down so fast on Olive Street, it lost control and it drove into their, um, into their front yard. It did, I think it, it damaged the tree as well, but they were, their house is, is very close behind that hedge and they are considering building a stone wall at this point because they, they are that fearful that a car will 
enter their house next time. So that's one. And then the other was late, um, late uh, in the pre-vaccine pandemic. So that would have probably been early spring of this year. My neighbor and I, who were walking there every single day along Old Springfield, as we were walking back toward Olive Street, we um, found ourselves about two minutes, uh, having arrived about two minutes after a car came so fast down that road. It was a sedan um, with two young men in, inside, probably barely out of their teens. Um, they came down so fast, they lost control. They hit the embankment, which has a steep curb, then hit a tree and were completely flipped over. The car was on its back by the time we got there and um, emergency vehicles were just arri arriving. Um, the young men were thankfully okay, but really rattled. And we were terrified because uh, um, we realized that we had just paused for about five minutes, just a, a few hundred yards up. And had we been on our normal trajectory, we may have collided with that, um, with that car. So, um, you know, those are two examples. I don't know if they made it into the police record, but of close calls right in the area where everyone is describing. Okay. Thank you, Lily. Okay, next is uh, Maris. Hey there. Um, I just want to echo, I also live on Olive Street. I live at 52. I submitted the complaint that's on the screen right now. Um, and I think what I want to emphasize is I think someone early on mentioned that there haven't been a lot of incidents to date. Lily just relayed a few incidents. And the reason I submitted this is because I'm worried there will be an incident. Um, as someone else on our street noted, there's been an influx of children in our neighborhood. There are people with strollers who walk down this hill. I personally walk down this hill probably at least five days a week with my dog. Um, so I would just appreciate additional study of this issue and consideration. Okay, thank you. Brett, go ahead. Thank you. I just had a question about the data. I support using data. Data-driven analysis is great, um, but only some pieces of the data were provided um as is appropriate but i'm curious what would make for um a speeding problem uh, chief casper mentioned there wasn't a significant speeding problem and i just don't i'm not familiar enough if you could let me know what would constitute a speeding problem you know what what what's the what's the top 15 percent look like i'm just curious about those kinds of things um thanks that's it Yep. Uh, so we use a software program that basically analyzes whether or not there's a whether or not the there's a speeding problem. So it's it's about 10 to 15 percent that fall into a um, enforceable level. So a few miles over the speed limit wouldn't fall into an enforceable level. Say it was a 30 mile per hour zone and people are going 32 or 33. That's not really something that police typically enforce. But if you set that threshold at say five miles over, and then you have 10 to 15 percent of cars traveling um, in that range, that would start to trigger the you have a speeding problem here. And it rates them, the software program that we use rates them by low, medium, or high enforcement priorities. This was rated as low, uh, with only 11 cars traveling in the enforcement uh, zone. Okay, thanks, Chief. Um, Brett, I don't know if you have uh, uh, any other comments, but... Um... We just want to make sure that that um, nothing further there. Okay. Um, any other comments, Councillor Nash? I see your hand up. Thank you, Director. Let's see. Am I unmuted here? I'm I'm on Google Maps looking at the street. Okay. Um, so uh, overall, I just want to say that this. As you know, as a city councilor and somebody who's been part of the TPC for, I guess, uh, about six years now, that this is another case of where we 
we definitely don't have speeding, but there is speeding. And what I mean is that the overall population of cars that are traveling along the street are actually traveling. And, and I think um, Chief Casper said that the, the number was 22 miles an hour. Did I get that right? For the 85th percentile? Yep, the 85th percentile is 22.3 miles per hour. And I just want to say that is a lovely number. Um, and that if we could have all streets coming in around that, that would be terrific. At the same time, what this traffic study process would do is any of the, the v, any of those uh, events or trips by vehicles where people are, uh, you know, doing excessive speeding, they're not going to show up in the data. And I, I think that that's, you know, um, you know, Lily referred to the two young men who managed to flip a car in that they were definitely going well over 22 miles an hour. And, and their data, had they traveled down the street that day, would not have ended up in the study. And that, um, and this isn't to say that the, the system's rigged against this. It's, it's just to say that's, that's the way the data is drawn up. And so that the, the events that really get people to fill out forms like this and call their counselor and call the police. And, you know, it, it we, I've heard these all across the city and that, um, and, and I, and I posed this question to Chief Casper before, um, uh, that, that what are the tools that we have outside of posting an officer to get these, these outliers? And I, I'm, I'm not sure we have, I think the answer is that we don't have a really good answer. And I'm gonna keep going, Chief Casper, just, um, and, and then you can um, weigh in on that. But that with the outliers, we just have really bad tools. For everybody else, we have really good tools. They're called signs, they're called speed humps, they're called uh, you know uh, signs with children at play on them and things like that. And that people who are, um, you know, respectfully thinking about what they're doing while they're driving their vehicle, that's how we end up at 22 miles an hour. And the, so the issue is, how do we get those, the, the other, the people of, in the upper 15% who are making people feel unsafe? Um, I will say this, that um, I, I want to add here from looking at Google Maps that uh, that this is this is a classic Northampton street that used to be a farm road and is, is kind you know it went from farm road to residential street and it's really actually never quite uh, transitioned once it starts to drop down to the floodplain. There is no sidewalk there and and I would imagine just as people are reporting there's lots of people walking through there. Um, from Google Maps, I don't see any signage both um, uh, in terms of uh, indicating that there's going to be a hill or a turn ahead um, that might uh, be helpful for people to, to convey to them, you might want to slow down a little. And also maybe, maybe some signage indicating that what is ahead is a shared street that, or that there might be pedestrians in the roadway. Um, it, as it continues out into the meadows, that, that's what it is. Um, those, those are things I, I, I think might be worth exploring here. Uh, but again, you know, the, 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 the lone driver speeding through the neighborhood is, is really the, the thing I think we really wish we could stop in this in, instance here. And I, I'm not quite sure how to do it. And I think Chief Casper might wanna answer that. <laughs> Well, I, I wish I had a, a good answer for that too. I, I mean, this is tricky. It's one of those situations where there are 11 people who drove on the street this one week that we measured that should have received citations or, or would, you know, we're, we're operating at those levels. And just deploying our resources to cap to get those 11 drivers is very tricky. You know, when we have four or five people working, <clears throat> dedicating an officer to one street to catch these 11 people over a five day period is tricky. And this isn't the first time we've had streets like this where they have kind of a unique problem. And actually the North Street neighborhood comes to mind, Lincoln Day, where we have these like random commercial vehicles driving up the street, but it's like one in a day 
and that it's just hard from an enforcement way, you know, enforcement strategy to, to address this problem. So I agree with you, Councillor, that there's it's less of an enforcement issue than it is, you know, considering other options uh, that that might slow down those few drivers. Although I don't know that there is one, since there are already signs and laws and uh, you know things to remind drivers to slow down. But if an officer were there, they would definitely have there. There would have been eleven citations. And um, right, right. I mean, the, the vehicles would have been stopped, and, and yes, they could have issued citations or warnings or whatever they would have done. But well, we it don't want police taken... officers everywhere handing out citations all the time. So it's, it's tricky to cover all the streets. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right, I did my rant. I'm done. <laughs> okay, Adam, go ahead. I see your hand up. Thank you. Um, so I. I'm just going to work backwards for a second here. My understanding is that because there's not a posted speed limit there, that the speed limit is 30 miles an hour. Is that correct? That's correct. It's a default speed limit. Yeah. Okay. So, the, so, so the if you set the actionable uh, limit at 30 at 35, um, that would be considered actionable. But I think that the the, the there's sort of a I think that the mismatch here is that I don't it that that street should have a lower speed limit is the problem um, because I think if somebody's going through there I'm familiar with that street because my niece used to live right at the top of it um, and uh, I've used that but the, you know the problem is is that there's a transition from darkness to light when you're coming out of the woods and then you come up into the neighborhood um, that the the video that the woman produced showed it really well. It's like, there's a, there's a, a huge visibility problem. Um, the, uh, it, it's, just, I think that what I'm trying to get at is that, is that, is that the, the actionable speed limit is far too high. And I, and I, and I, from my understanding, um, you know, if somebody came through there at 32 miles an hour, which would might not be actionable, that that's just they're going to be on both sides of the road, absolutely. Um, so my thing is that I feel like the speed limit, the default speed limit, is too high, and I realize that that starts a whole. You know, I think you'd probably need to do a traffic study and a lot of different things. But I that's what I feel like the the neighbors are trying to say, or is what I feel is missing from this conversation, and I will desist. Okay, thanks. Um, I, Scotia, I see your actual hand up. Um, so we'll see if we can find you and unmute you in the list here. Thank you. Yep, go ahead. All right, thank you very much. So I live on 17 4th Street. Um, I recently moved back to the South Street neighborhood after an absence of, God, 30 years more. Um, I grew up in the neighborhood. It's a great place. It's always been kid friendly. It's always been neighborhood friendly. It's always been walkability friendly. Um, and just from observation, I've seen just live, having bought a house here last March, I've seen a big uptick in traffic since the bridge was opened through the Arcadia Wildlife Sanctuary over the Mill River. When that bridge was closed, there was not nearly as much traffic and that was during the winter. I've seen at least subjectively a big uptick. I mean, it's a it's an old back road to East Hampton, hence the name Old Springfield Road. Um, and the summer months get really busy. Pickup trucks, farm equipment, as stated, um, and Jim Nash is correct. It's an old farm road <clears throat> that's basically turned into a suburban road. Olive Street and Forest Street. There are both very narrow roads. There are very old roads that are the original routes to, to Springfield from that area. Uh, and the data that was collected was seasonal and that was what, 2020, so that was during the pandemic, correct? Um, if that's the case, then it doesn't really reflect some of the, the newer, at least, uh, commuting activity since the economy has probably improved a little bit. 
So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, so just a, uh, I'll just have one note about um, speed limits, you know, in the absence of a regulatory speed limit, which is the black and white sign that you see all over the city, the default speed limit uh, is in effect, and that is 30 miles an hour for this roadway. Um, I will add that um, in order to put a speed regulation in effect, an extensive engineering study is required. Um, that engineering study um, then has to go to mass DOT for approval. The city doesn't get to pick what we want the speed limit to be, meaning um, we would not be able to hire a, a consultant and say, we would like you to study this road and then generate a speed limit of 20 miles an hour for us. Um, there are, you know, when we talk about a data-driven process, this is the ultimate data-driven process. There are very particular metrics um, that need to be analyzed. Um, reviewed, and then a speed limit is uh, implemented based on those metrics. They include uh, turning movements and vehicle counts, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, you know, uh, vehicle types. Um, so it's really the ultimate in data driven. Um, and, and there is, um, there is uh, no choice on the city's part. So um, if we were to commission any sort of seed speed study on this road or any other road, um, we do not get to choose the results. And often um, what you find is the results are actually not what you think they should be, or you may disagree with the results. Um, but again, that's not something that we get to choose. So I just want to um, throw that out there because um, a lot of folks ask us to modify speed limits. Um, but I, I think it's just important to um, note um, what actually, you know, um, happens as part of that. Um, so uh, in the interest of um, moving through the rest of the agenda, I'll, I'll ask if anyone on the uh, commission has uh, any other comments on on uh, this or any questions. Nancy, go ahead, I see your hand up. It seems to me that the overall input is that this is a real seasonal problem also, and that there was um, concern that the traffic study that was done um, was not done during those peak months. Um, that said, is there any way to go back and to pull those numbers again? It, would that be appropriate? Because that seems to be something that is repeated over and over again. I, I can answer that a little bit. I mean, I, I get it in this circumstance around seasonal issues, but we continue to run into this where if we collect data that doesn't support a speeding problem or identify one, people want it recollected. And so just in an interest of kind of, we, we try to be fair to every neighborhood that's raising speeding concerns. And it's tricky when we get requests for remeasure the speed. And this is not the first time we've had that request. I understand in this circumstance, there is a seasonal issue and I'm, I'm respectful of that, but I think we just want to be mindful of also the fact that we, you know, we, we don't want to set a precedent of just going and recollecting data um, if the data is not what people thought it would be. And, and so it's a little bit tricky. Yeah, and, and I'll also add that, it, you know, one of the things that is important for us is, it, you know, we have to have a starting point as, as part of refining this process. Um, and, and as part of our effort to really help neighborhoods and to resolve a lot of these concerns citywide, um, the chief and I thought it was important that we actually have some uh, starting point um, for neighborhoods and, and that when we have a meeting like this and ask people to come to it and speak to us, um, that we have something to share with you. Um, so that is, uh, that is part of our process here. We hear everything that has been said today. Um, and, you know, we will take all of those comments under advisement um, and, and then we will um, move to um, see what we can do about the situation. So I, I'll just uh, add that in as well. Councilor Nash, did I see your hand up? Yes, you did. And um, so I, I just wanted, it, I, I just to um, frame, I, 
I think that it would, I, my request would be is if, if we could explore some signage around the, the, the hill portion of the street. As it does get narrow, there is no sidewalk. <laughs> and um, that we heard a, no, a number of concerns about that. Um, and I also just want to note that uh, like High Street in Florence, uh, the last, uh, when we, we, we met a few months ago, that, um, that this, this is a street with an unposted speed limit and that we actually could lower the speed limit here. The problem by accepting the unposted 25 mile an hour speed limit from the state. It comes with the problem of we couldn't put up a sign saying that on Olive Street because then it would be a posted speed limit. Um, but I, you know, I, I, I think I'm gonna look into uh, what's going on with the other neighborhood streets over there a little further, but it's, it's once again, I'm, I'm plugging for us to move towards that <laughs> with the idea that it's, it's, it doesn't solve things in the way that uh, we would hope. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I do, Councillor Foster, go ahead. I'll be really quick. Um, Nancy sort of said what, what I was thinking as well. And I, I really understand the desire not to set a precedent for kind of recollecting data um, if it's not matching what people anticipate. Although in, in this case, and I'm, I'm quite familiar with that area. And I think we also, I don't think it's an accident that we're seeing this uh, come before us, you know, at a time during COVID when many people, many more people are outdoors and there's probably, uh, you know, a confluence of more people out walking um, as well as more people visiting the neighborhood or the meadows, um, additionally the bridge. So um, I, I would be interested in exploring both signage um, as well as um, the, the consideration of restudying um, the traffic next summer. Um, but, you know, I, 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 do, I do hear all sides on that, but um, this definitely points to a seasonal uh, concern. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Um, I, I do see um, I, uh, another hand, um, a couple of questions in the, uh, in the chat. Um, in the interest of time, I, I do need to move on and I would encourage those who either wish to speak on this topic or who have a question for us um, to please email us at dpwinfo at northamptonma.gov um, and we will um, respond to you uh, outside of the time constraints of this meeting. So that's dpwinfo, I-N-F-O at northamptonma.gov. Um, or you are also welcome to call us at the DPW and our phone number is 413-587-1570, 413-587-1570. One five seven zero. So, um, I I do need to keep the the meeting moving as it's as it's getting late. So, um, if there are no other um, comments from members of the commission uh, on this, we will move on to the next agenda item. Um, and there will be um, follow up uh, from the police chief and from I through this commission. Um, to uh, the residents of the Olive Street neighborhood. And we will also engage with Councillor Thorpe um, prior to uh, any um, action on our part. So thank you. Okay, moving on next is 5E, a proposed ordinance for accessible parking in recreation and conservation areas. Um, this is quite long, so bear with me and I will read it as quickly as possible. In the year 2021, upon the recommendation of the Transportation and Parking Commission, an ordinance relative to off-street handicapped parking spaces, an ordinance of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, be it ordained by the City Council of the City of Northampton and City Council assembled as follows, Section 1. Section 312-117 of the Code of Ordinances be amended as follows. Section 312-117, Schedule 16, on, on street and off street handicap parking spaces. B, off street handicap parking spaces are established as follows. Parking lot, Florence Recreation Fields dash West Lot location, three spaces on the Northern edge closest to the bathrooms abutting the pedestrian crosswalk, one being van accessible. Parking lot, Florence Recreation Fields dash East Lot location, six spaces dispersed along the Western edge of the parking lot, one being van accessible. Parking lot, Sheldon Field dash West Lot location, three spaces in the Northwest corner, one being van accessible. Parking lot Sheldon Field dash East lot, one van accessible space abutting south of the entrance to the basketball court. Parking lot means field, two spaces on the southwest corner of the paved parking area, one, one being van accessible. Um, that is uh, 
that will need to be corrected. It says once Arcanum Field dash North Lot, one van accessible space on the southeast corner, Arcanum Field dash South Lot, three spaces on the southeast corner, one being van accessible. Veterans Field, two spaces on the southwest corner, abutting the sidewalk to the skate park, one being van accessible. Broadbook dash Fitzgerald Lake Greenway, one van accessible space on the northeast corner, abutting the information kiosk, Musanti Beach North Lot, two spaces on the northwest corner, one being van accessible, Musanti Beach South Lot. One van accessible space on the northwest corner abutting the parking lot entrance. Ray Ellerbrook Fields, two spaces on the southeast corner abutting the western edge of the baseball diamond, one being van accessible. One space on the northern edge closest to the soccer field, Smith Vocational Agricultural Fields. Two spaces on the northwest corner abutting the trail entrance, one being van accessible. And I have a motion for a positive recommendation, please. Move approval or move a positive recommendation. Second. Okay, thank you. And I see uh, Keith is here with us. Um, Keith, I'm gonna ask you to speak to this. If you could, please, we will unmute you. Yeah, um, so this really kind of came out of um, just looking at our, our conservation areas or recreation areas and just seeing that, you know, there is uh, currently, um, most of them do not have um, uh, accessible spaces, but then it's not uh, being uh, uh, it's not being checked. Um, so, what's the process for if someone's parked there? Um, it's if it's not on the schedule, then there's no kind of recourse. Um, but I did the analysis, kind of walked all of these, um, and I tried to try to be as um, as particular as I could with the the, the definitions. Uh, so if there's uh, if there needs to be more clarity than the ordinance, uh, I'm happy to kind of um, make those changes. And I did see the once if in there a few times needed to be changed. Thanks, Keith. I think that's uh, just a Scribner's error that can be corrected prior to sending this to the council clerk. Okay. Any uh, discussion on the commission on this? Okay, Councilor Nash. I just want to say this is great. Thanks for doing this. This is it, it's terrific that um, we're we're paying you know we're paying attention to this. So thank you. Okay, Councilor Foster, go ahead. Just to echo um, Councilor Nash's thanks to you, Keith, um, for for looking at this and inventorying and, and bringing this forward. And then a similar point as the previous ordinance, we can take a look at at. Um, language in the title, which I, I know why it's there, um, and then consider with legislative matters or whatever process um, there is. Okay. Thanks, Councillor. Any other comments on this? Nancy, go ahead. Uh, I absolutely support this ordinance because without the actual legal ordinance, we can't enforce it. So thank you very much, Keith, for what you what you've done with them, I appreciate it. Okay, thanks, Nancy. Okay, any other comments? Okay, hearing none, Beth, please call the roll. Beth, we gotta unmute you. There you go. Donna? Yes. Judy? Yes. yes. Jamie? Yes. Wayne? Did Wayne leave? Wayne left at 5.30. Um, Nancy? Yes. Karen? Yes. Jim? Yes. Adam? Did Adam leave? No, Adam's here, but not oh, there he is. Oh, sorry, yes. And Diana. Yes. That's approved. Okay, thank you. Next is item six, updates from the commission chair and vice chair about previously considered traffic calming applications. Um, so uh, I'll start with Cross Street, but Cross Street, Pine Street, and Orchard Street are 
um, all neighborhoods which uh, submitted uh, traffic calming applications. Um, we went through a, a similar process as to what you heard from Olive Street today. Um, and what we have done is uh, taken those comments uh, that we received uh, at this commission and you know, written emails, uh, suggestions from residents, um, taken all of that under advisement and uh, responded to the residents. Um, and so I will just, um, the, the chief and I will run through um, what we've done. So I'll start with Cross Street. The date of the request was November 15th, 2020. Um, and there were uh, a variety of, of things on Cross Street that um, the neighborhood was concerned about. Um, one of them was speeding. Um, others were parking along the area of the river. There was also visibility concerns at the intersection um, with Bliss Street. Um, and so uh, through a combination of analysis of speed data um, and an engineering assessment of the area, we implemented the uh, following improvements. Um, the, the, uh, uh, what we determined was that uh, stop signs were warranted at the intersection of Cross Street and Florence Road and Cross Street and Bliss Street. Um, that was because of li limited visibility at that intersection. Um, we also, uh, DPW, um, removed uh, the hedge that has been uh, vexing so many motorists at that intersection. Um, and DPW actually had to remove that because the uh, neighbor uh, or the owner of that property was non-responsive. Um, but we did have to go through a, a, an ordinance process to make that happen. Um, there is also now a parking restriction on the river side of that road. Um, and that will help to maintain the integrity of the shoulder and drainage. It should help with um, visibility for um, folks traveling up and down that roadway, particularly during the summer months when, when volume increases, um, uh, traffic volume. Um, the data did not reveal a significant uh, speeding problem on Cross Street. Um, so that is how we have resolved the, uh, the situation on Cross Street and all of those changes have been implemented. Implemented. Um, Chief, I don't know if you have anything to add on, on Cross Street. Nothing on Cross. Okay. And uh, I just want to recognize Councillor Jarrett, who's who's here, um, and, and I will ask you to unmute. Uh, welcome, Councillor. Thank you, Director. Um, yeah, thanks for the, all the operations and changes that you made on Cross Street. I think especially the removal of the hedge uh, has made it a very much better in terms of visibility um, and uh, the parking situation as well seems to be uh, doing well. So I have not been hearing complaints from my constituents as I had before. Um, so that's good news. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, next I'll move on to Pine Street. Um, we received uh, uh, several traffic calming requests for Pine Street um, starting uh, back in February of this year. Um, Pine Street, as some of you may know, is uh, un under construction right now. So one of the things that we um, want to do is implement um, the positive improvements to the roadway uh, as part of that construction project just um, for sort of economic and, and um, efficiency reasons. Um, so uh, Chief, why don't I, um, I turn this over to you to just talk a little bit about the speed data that you collected here. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we collected speed data and measured the speeds of 17,107 vehicles. Uh, the posted speed limit is both in both directions is 30 miles per hour. And the average speed was 25. The 85th percentile speed was 29.1. So just about one mile an hour under the posted speed limit. So speed was not identified as a significant factor on Pine Street. During the collision analysis, that did reveal a lot more data we did a five-year look back. There were 65 collisions on Pine Street in the five years, which is certainly a significant number of collisions. It is a, a longer street, um, but notable that uh, 44 of those collisions <clears throat> were at the intersection of Pine and Maple. So this is a, an intersection that has been a concern of mine for years, and I'm glad to see uh, things moving forward on this. Um, the other 21 collisions, uh, we looked at those 
Um, five of them were at the intersection with Park Street and, and four of those uh, were with the intersection with Nonatuck Street. There weren't really any detectable patterns in those. Uh, the ones on Park Street, it's notable that they involve pedestrians who were struck by vehicles. And so this is an area with, with certainly some pedestrian activity due to the, you know, there's the, the nearby mini mart there in that small mall. And people use this as a cut through from getting from the Florence area to get to downtown Florence from the residential area. So I think it's unexpected for some drivers to see pedestrians in that section of Pine Street. Um, but beyond that, uh, no notable collisions call, caused by speed outside of that four-way intersection. We're already aware of the problems with the four-way intersection, so I was really looking at the other collisions. So that's an overview of the collision and speed data on Pine. Thanks, Chief. And, and I'll talk a little bit um, about what we're doing as part of this construction project. Um, so as members of this commission um, may know, we, we uh, entertain several ordinances here um, related to this project uh, to create a, an all-way stop um, at the intersection of Pine and Maple and also um, to make Man Terrace a one-way, which exits onto Pine Street, um, and, and to uh, actually completely reconfigure that intersection. Um, that, that proposal was a result of, again, us engaging an outside consultant to study the intersection and make recommendations about how, how we should best proceed. So those ordinances came before this commission several months ago and were passed by council and will, be, um, will actually be reflected in the field um, within the next couple of months um, as construction um, it starts to wind down here. Um, we've also um, made several other improvements to uh, the entire length of Pine Street that is under construction and that includes reconstructing sidewalks. Um, it includes um, actually shrinking the intersections um, of Chestnut and Beacon Street. Right now, they're, they're very wide-mouthed, um, and, and our, um, our design to do that actually came out of the many comments that we received at this commission um, from residents who appeared to speak about, um, you know, speeding cars and, and concerns. Um, and, and what we try to do is use roadway geometry to the extent possible to create the perception um, that people actually need to slow down because as we know, uh, a lot of times motorists don't necessarily obey speed limit signs. So um, what we have to do is create an environment where they feel that they cannot drive as fast as they want to. And it, and it actually sort of, um, it, it's like a psychology, um, if you will. Um, so those intersections are, are actually being shrunk down. And, um, you know, as part of that, I will add that we do have to do some drainage work. Um, so, you know, anytime we're changing roadway um, configuration like that, there, there certainly is a, a significant expense uh, associated with that. Um, and I will also add that the section of roadway by the church um, that's on Beacon Street. Um, we, we have um, uh, an issue with the placement of the sidewalk there. We cannot build the sidewalk on private property. So we actually have to shrink that section of roadway um, by four feet, which is gonna have the overall effect of, of really um, narrowing that roadway in a way that, that I think is gonna uh, slow traffic considerably when that project is done. So um, that's something I'm, um, it, it, I'm actually pleased um, to be able to uh, have implemented something like that as part of this project. Um, so our our response uh, at this point, uh, a lot of um, a lot of folks had asked for you know speed humps or raised crosswalks um, as part of this project. But um, I, again, based on the data which we collected um, and the design of the roadway, um, we feel that there is not a significant speeding problem here. Um, we would not preemptively install um, speed humps or speed tables um, in a road like this. Um, and we feel that the improvements we're making uh, will be an impediment to people um, you know, traveling at, at, at higher speeds uh, than, we are, than they already are. So that is um, that is the resolution of Pine Street, Councillor. I don't know if you have any um, if you have any comments about that. Um, we'll let me you in a moment here, Councillor Jarrett. Great, thank you. Yes, um, residents and and myself as well. We're very excited about the 
the construction and the changes that you're making in response to our concerns. Um, I did not know about the narrowing of the street uh, by the church, so that's great news. I think that will all be um, help a lot. I know that that's the area uh, where much of the speeding has been reported and that combined with the narrowing of those intersections, um, it should give us some, uh, a great improvement. Um, I do ask that you know we pay attention to what happens after this is this is completed because now we'll have um, you know instead of potholes we'll have smooth pavement and that can encourage people to drive rather quickly. Um, so let's pay attention to that and and then see if anything else needs to happen after that point. So thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks you, Councillor. And I, I just want to acknowledge um, that that the chief and I um, got your email, um, and she and I actually um, spoke yesterday. Um, and I've been working on this sidewalk issue by the church, and I was um, I, I was holding on that. Um, I, I was holding on a response, um, you know, in, until we could talk here. But I, I'll follow up with you um, offline about that as well. So thank you. Um, Okay, and uh, finally, um, I, I just want to hit the uh, Orchard Street application that we received. Um, so, Chief, I'll let you speak uh, a little bit to, to what you found on Orchard Street. Thank you. Uh, yep, collected speed data uh, in December from December 7th to the 22nd. We included about 8,400 vehicles. The 85th percentile was 26 miles per hour. So this was classified as a low enforcement priority with, with not a significant uh, speeding issue. Also, we did a five-year collision look back. There were only four collisions. One of them, while it was listed as Orchard Street, actually occurred as a vehicle was pulling off of Orchard under bridge. So really three accidents that occurred officially on the street. Um, one was a distracted driver and others involved people backing out of driveways. So. Um, nothing particularly speed related here and, and a low number of collisions overall. Okay. Thanks, Chief. Um, it, yeah, and I just want to add, it, you know, our, our assessment of this and review of the complaint, which was about speeding vehicles, um, you know, the speed limit's 30 miles an hour here. Um, and, and as Councilman Nash said earlier, you know, the data we collected here um, is, is really what we would love to see in, in plenty of other places throughout the city. Um, we do not recommend any action on this street. Um, and, and we have been um, in touch with Councillor Nash about this, um, as well as the resident who, who made the initial request. Um, so that's a follow up on, on those items um, and hopefully a positive resolution for these folks. Um, okay, next, is there any new business? Okay, hearing none, uh, may I have a motion to adjourn, please? Motion to adjourn. Second. Any discussion? Okay, Beth, please call the roll. Donna? Yes. Jody? Yes. Jamie? Yes. Uh, Wayne's still gone, right? Yes, Wayne's gone. Uh, Nancy? Yes. Karen? Yes. Jim? Yes. Adam? Yes. Diana? Yes. Motion passes. Okay. Thanks, everyone. See you next month. Thank you. Bye. Great night. Bye. You too.